So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the curriculum committee for February 1st, 2024. In accordance with board policy, the chair of a committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items will be done by roll call vote. Board members will state their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Lichter? Present. Ms. Pumphrey? Present. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Present. Ms. Dominowski? Here. Ms. Dolosky? Present. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cox, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. DiDonato? Present. Ms. Shea? Present. Dr. Wistad? Present. Dr. Elmendorf? Ms. Myers? Present. And we also have Ms. Fisher? We do not have Ms. Fisher, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Ms. Lagerman? Present. Dr. Jones? Dr. Jones? She's there, I see her. She just didn't I see her. Yeah. Dr. Kraft? Present. Dr. Wolf? Present. And Ms. Wicks? Um, she will not be attending this afternoon. I was going to say, I okay. believe Ms. Wicks has exciting news in her family today and won't be joining. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Committee members will um, facilitate discussion by calling off names of committee member. Uh, committee chairs will facilitate discussion by calling off names of committee members to speak. In turn, committee members will also acknowledge if they have a question by calling on the chair, then stating their name. Staff members will answer any questions posed by committee members by saying their name first, then speaking. Staff members that want to add to any discussion may call on the chair to speak, then saying their name. Okay. If the chair calls for any motions, the committee member will um, make and say their name, and a second committee member will second and say their name. The chair will then state, may I have a roll call vote? And assistants will speak each committee member for their vote and record appropriately. Okay. All right, um, before we start the um, form, more formal presentations, the first um, new business is possible change date of our March curriculum committee meeting. So remember, we have to align with buildings and contracts because we approve first before buildings and contracts. And to align with the building and contract meeting scheduled for March 4th, 2024, Dr. DiDonato would like um, us to reschedule our March meeting from March 7th to February 26th at 4.30 p.m. So I just wanted to see if we would still have a quorum if we moved it to that date. So um, any of the board members on, oh, hi, Ms. Booker Dwyer. I'm not sure we got you in the roll call. Um, so are members available on February 26th at 4.30. Ms. Stileski, does that work for you? Yes. Ms. Thank you. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes, that works for me. Good, thank you. Ms. Dominowski? Yes, I just checked. It looks good. Oh, wow. This is going well. All right, Ms. Tierra Booker. Ms. Booker Dwyer, Ms. Yes, Tierra Booker. Right. Sorry. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes, that works for me. That works <gasps> Holy. for me. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay, Ms. Look at Cox. you doing a dance. I know. <laughs> Well, to get anything scheduled today. or rescheduled, usually you need like, you know, a proclamation from somebody, but it worked. So good. OK, now we'll move on um, to the first topic, which is school year 24-25 course updates. And I think, um, Dr. DiDonato, do you want to start or are we going right to Ms. Shea? I'm going to turn right over to Ms. Shea to get started. I did want to just, um, Ms. Kasali Mishinda from our Director of Mathematics is also on the call um, and got laughed off at the beginning, so I just wanted to interject that it real quickly she'll be coming on for a later presentation. Okay, thank you. Okay, Ms. Shea, 
Right. Thank you, um, Chair Lichter. <clears throat> well, committee Chair Lichter. <laughs> um, I'm here today to bring forward our um, winter phase form process. So the phase form process is what we use to make any changes, updates, um, or deletions to our course catalog. And so this is an important part of our process that we do to support schools in offering um, different courses to align with our students' program of study. You can go to the next slide. I'm going to go quickly since I know you had an opportunity to listen to it. Um, as I mentioned, we use this process um, typically uh, twice a year. We bring forward uh, new courses that we're going to be building new curriculum for in the future or any changes that need to be made to the course catalog as right now stu students are registering for their classes for next year. Next slide. So um, this winter, I'm bringing forward 20 course change requests. You can see that they range um, in CTE, math, performing arts, and visual arts. You can go to the next slide. The changes are sometimes about name changes. Um, this becomes important because we want to make sure that the course descriptions are accurate and that the title reflects the course content. Um, we are also bringing forward, you can go to the next slide, um, some changes that are related to um, the level of rigor. Um, hot off the presses, I do want to note in the presentation I had shared that we have an ESOL math course and uh, the recommendation that we were bringing forward was to change it from earning a math credit to being a supplemental course that would be served as a way of supplementing a course for our multilingual learners. Um, I do want to share that we have welcomed a new director of multilingual learner achievement to strengthen our infrastructure to support multilingual learners. And so in partnership with our director of mathematics, they are actually working to see um, how we might strengthen this course. So part of the reason we were originally um, shifting that is we want to make sure that our multilingual learners are enrolled in math courses that are rigorous and that we make sure they have an opportunity to engage in content. Um, that is aligned with grade level course level standards at the high school level while keeping them on track for graduation. We also know that we have students who come to us as newcomers that may have severely interrupted formal education. Uh, these are students who may have refugee status, may not have had formal schooling, and so while they come to us and certainly are incredibly bright, they may have gaps. And so the original, the intended purpose of a, an ESOL high school math course is really to prepare students for that readiness to enter that algebra course sequence in a timely way that provides that scaffold to those higher level courses. So um, that may change even this year as we think about uh, moving forward. So we're actually going to um, pause on making any change to that course for right now, but we'll certainly bring back an update in the spring. Some of the other changes that you probably heard in the presentation is we also want to try to um, add prerequisites to courses and you can go to the next slide. We also want to make a distinction between middle school courses and high school courses and this is to um, make it very clear for families about what earns high school credit in the high school level versus courses that may be taken at the middle school level, especially in some of our um, magnet programs. Next slide. Um, and then we also did have a couple of other courses um, in performing arts that were shifting either the course title to more accurately reflect what's happening in those courses. And again, to have that shift to separate the um, grades that they're available in to clean that up. Next slide. Um, and then part of the high school fine arts credit, students, um, as, a, as you probably are aware, students have a requirement in, um, from MSCE to earn a 1.0 fine arts credit. And so we were making updates to some of our visual arts courses, specifically in design and clay, um, to reflect that this can be a part of that full um, credit they need to earn in fine arts, but it only counts as a half of that total. So this would expect students to take maybe multiple courses in fine arts to earn that credit. Next slide. You can keep going because this is very similar. Same thing with photography. All right, next slide. Thank you. And then we do have 10 new course requests um, that I wanted to share. You can go to the next slide. Again, they're at the elementary, middle, and high school level. Next slide. And so um, the math course that we are, um, and part of the process right now is in order to be able to work on piloting a course and uh, working through that curriculum, we need to have a course in the master course file um, for that to exist. And so we have shared about um, previously in presentations with this committee around our efforts to create more entry points for students for mathematics. 
in alignment with some of the changes in Comar around that identification happening at the end of second grade. And so while we all discussed how we want to make sure there's early and often identification and multiple entry points, that required us creating that first course in the sequence to begin at that advanced math third. And then some of the other new courses are just reflective of the previous presentation about course changes as we separate high school and middle school. We need to make sure that there's a course in the course catalog for both. Next slide. You can keep going. I will just offer that the IB sports exercise. Um, we have an IB sports um, health program at Kenwood High School. And as we continue to um, that extend that pathway. We want to make sure that students have options within that same pathway to earn that IB diploma. And so we're extending that pathway. In partnership with special education, um, the special education team, as you know, and you'll hear more later about the strategic plan, we do have that integrated service delivery model. Um, this course is a function of supporting teachers. We may have integrated service delivery um, model courses that are multi-grade. And so by having a course, we're able to have students access that curriculum in one course, which helps teachers and families when they're navigating through Schoology. We're excited about the middle school eight media art. Um, we know that our students are very excited about things like digital art and uh, using different design principles. We wanna add that at the eighth grade level so that we can help students develop that interest um, because it might help them pursue a different pathway in some of our high school programming. And um, last but not least, this is an intersectionality of how we're expanding language opportunities um, and our efforts to earn that seal of biliteracy, prioritizing our native and heritage speakers. So this is often an opportunity for our multilingual learners to have an asset-based mindset of earning that Maryland seal of biliteracy through taking a course that continues to build on their literacy in their native language. And so we um, had started that with Spanish for Native and Heritage Speakers A, and so this is an opportunity for us to continue that pathway. So those are the changes I'm bringing forward. Um, and believe me, this is a light year for some of the, <laughs> the changes that we're making. Um, but I welcome any questions or, or comments or, or feedback from the committee. Any questions from board members? I just have one question. The special ed integrative, integrated service delivery model, was that formally known as fowls and cows? Is that the program? So yes, at the elementary level, um, Fowls and Cows were uh, distinguished as two separate programs. There was often, oh, Allison, there you are. Okay, look. Sorry, my Ms. camera Myers wasn't on two dance. Everyone, hi. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, though. Allison, you can go take it over. Yeah, so um, at the elementary level, we, um, about two years ago, combined the service delivery models of what were the functional learning support and the communication learning support um, into one service delivery model for students um, that addresses both functional and communication needs for that age range. Um, in the secondary, at the secondary level, middle and high school, it does, we do continue with that, um, the two models for the functional um, communication or the functional learning support and then the communication learning support needs. So, so the reason for the course is just so in the system, that's how they're yeah, so cur currently if teachers had um, you know a range of first and second graders in their courses those kids would be would have been enrolled separately so a student in Schoology and families in Schoology would have been managing nine different classes instead of one because students would have been enrolled in math and literacy for first grade and math and literacy for second grade mm -hmm. and so it's really just a function of helping them provide that interaction um, in a more streamlined way they still have access to that um, opportunity for curriculum but this way having that unified course allows for that communication and um, assigning of materials for the, the teacher to facilitate that. That was feedback we got from a lot of teachers. I'm sure. OK, thank you. Ms. Booker Dwyer, you have a question? Yes, I have sure. a question. Can you hear me? No. Nope. Yes. 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 Oh, now we don't. You, you're on your phone and your computer, right? I must have a little All right, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, I am. I'm on my phone and computer. It's been one of those days. So um, I have a question about the non-credit bearing um, ESOL math course. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit more about this course? Is this just a remedial math course? 
So for our newcomers, it's not quite remedial, it's more acceleration. And so when our students come in, our newcomer multilingual learners, um, as part of their enrollment at the Welcome Center, they have the WIDA assessment that helps assess their language proficiency. And uh, for our secondary students, they also take a math assessment. What we know is for some of our students, those prerequisite skills that would come under the umbrella like of algebra readiness may be gaps. And so the course is designed to sort of supplement and accelerate so we can quickly get them in that high school pathway of that algebra one geometry, algebra two sequence. So in some regards, um, it's less remedial and more acceleration, but the similarity is this idea of it being a companion course so that it would be something that they don't take um, instead of taking a course aligned to that math pathway that their peers are on. So could it be a pre-algebra course? To some degree, some of the skills, and certainly I welcome Ms. Machinda, our math expert, can join in too. Some of the skills go all the way back to things that might be approached in the middle school curriculum. Um, so really, some could argue that, you know, grades three through eight is pre-algebra. <laughs> and so to some degree, yes, but it may span um, prerequisite skills um, that come even before a typical pre-algebra course, depending on where the students place with that math assessment. And again, it's primarily used for newcomers, especially those that had interrupted formal education. So it isn't that they don't have math skills, it's that they haven't had an opportunity for instruction. And so the goal is if we're very targeted and specific to fill in some of those skills and that coherence framework with the College and Career Ready Center standards really helps us visualize those connection points so we can be very strategic in specific skills that are going to help build towards that algebra readiness. Ms. Machina, anything you want to so add? No way they oh, can get a credit for the, for the content that they're learning in math. Yeah, so the conversation that we're up right now, and that's why I said, you know, hot off the press is we're still in conversation with our, our new partner. What we don't want is students to be sort of put in this for a math credit instead of being in an Algebra 1 geometry or Algebra 2 course. We want them to be in both. And so the reason that we would propose that it not replace a math credit is because we don't want to disadvantage our multilingual learners when it's really just a matter of accelerating them back into that pathway. Is there any other credit option that could be offered? Because, I, and I don't know the data around this, not offering, offering a course for no credit. I don't, I don't know the data around that at the high school level. I know at the college level, it, it's actually a disincentive for students. It's like, you know, when they're on that remedial path. So I wouldn't want that reflected for our ESOL students, knowing that they have to accumulate so many credits before they graduate and they're in a class. And I could see a parent saying, well, my kid is in a class. Why are they not getting credit for the work that they're doing? So is there Absolutely. any type of credit that could be offered that would count toward graduation? Yes. Yes, and so when I say not credit bearing, part of it is that it would fill in electives. The challenge is that's not what kids are needing. So yes, it could in, 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 in that elective. I think what we want to make sure is it doesn't substitute for them having an opportunity to get to Algebra 2 or, or to get to even higher levels of mathematics as appropriate. So yes, they, would, they could get a credit. It just wouldn't necessarily be one of the math credits that they would need as part of our requirements so that it could be a both I, I and. Yeah, I think it will, will be important for them to sure. get a credit for it. Um, sure. Just thinking of families who are new to America and they don't understand the system and it's, their, their kid is in a class and they're thinking they it's counting it to count. towards something. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I, I so, totally. I mean, to and... offer it as an elective or something so that at least they're not losing out um, accumulating credits that they need toward graduation. Absolutely. And part of why I said it's hot off the presses sort of re-envisioning is for exactly that conversation. So in other words, the, the content of the course should drive the type of credit because another pathway you could see us again in a year to say we've revised the course and now it's so rigorous it does count as a math credit because it aligns with pre-algebra, right? So that's really the discussions that we're having. We want kids to feel like their efforts count. We want it to feel like an accelerated opportunity. We don't want it to disincentivize them from taking high levels of math. So that's really Really the discussion that we're in right now. Ms. Michelle, oh, I didn't mean to so hear that math expert. <laughs> Sorry. So yes, in that please. course, guys, then it'll come back to us as a 
credit or what what, what are the yep. next steps? So yeah, our plan discussion. is that. Yep, exactly right. That's why I was like hot off the presses. We're actually pausing because what we'll do is bring it back to you once they've had an opportunity to really examine what options are there to either strengthen that content. So we do feel like it, it aligns to the rigor of the standards for that course or say it is still going to get a credit, but it would be more of an elective because it doesn't. So so that's really um, and so that would be probably in the spring, usually I come back and I usually come three times a year in the fall. I have all the new courses for the 26th school year. You may remember then I come for any updates or changes and then usually we come back with anything that was in pilot that we need to confirm. So that would really be our time frame. Yep, that works. Thank you. Sure. Ms. Machinda, I'm sorry. I really do want to let you talk if you want to add anything as the math expert, please. Yes, Kasele and Machinda, um, I think you did cover everything. I think it's just the, about that conversation that is occurring and we'll provide some innovative options and in even scheduling that course so it could happen in tandem, right? So the first course credit could still be Algebra 1 with a level of support through an ESOL math course that makes sure that they're successful. So they stay on cohort, they earn the credit, and they're getting appropriate support. So I didn't, I, we are having those conversations to make sure we do what's best um, in the interest of students so they all have the same opportunities come senior year. Thank you. Thank you. Other board members with questions? OK, hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the course changes as presented? So move Stileski. Thank you. Is there a second? Second, Pump. Thank you. Ms. Cox, can we do a roll call vote, please? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? No, I thought we were modifying the the course so that it would be a credit and it would come back before us. Oh. I didn't know we were taking a vote. So um if if we could amend the motion to vote for the approval absent the high school math ESOL course, would that be possible? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I, okay. do we need to finish our vote first and then go back to amend or no? I, I think but, so. Look, I have my book in the car that has the rules. <laughs> <laughs> but we don't, um, we, that we, can't because we didn't pass. call for a discussion. We didn't call, wait, did we call for a discussion? Or would we second it, but then there was no, I don't know. We usually I mean, don't do a discussion because we just had the discussion, but in this case, we, um, okay. So who voted? Ms. Cox, how many yeses do you have right this minute? So far we have three, two. Two. So I need the last two to not to vote no, and then we can <laughs> come back and redo it, correct? Okay, sure. so Ms. Booker Dwyer, your vote is? No. No, right. And then who is the last one, Ms. Cox? Ms. Dominowski? No. Thank you. Ms. Zalowski? Okay. No. no. <laughs> okay. Okay, so the motion fails. Correct. May I have a motion to approve the course contracts minus the ESOL? What, did, what was the title? High School ESOL Math. High so, high does school. someone need to make a motion? Does she have to officially make a motion to do that? And then you can say to someone. Well, I was making. Or you're the, making um, the motion. She's making Got it. I'm, I'm so sorry. The, book. I just need my book in the car. Sorry. That's OK. I was making the amended motion. I was making the amended wording. I'm asking for someone to make a motion to approve the course okay. update minus the high school ESOL math course. OK, I can make the motion to approve the course update um, without the high saw ESOL math course. Thank you. Thank you. May I have a second? I second. Thank you. Now may we have a roll call vote on the amended motion? OK, Ms. Lichter? I don't know. No, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Dolatsky? Yes. Thank you. OK, that motion amended passes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for the confusion. Thank no, you, Ms. I appreciate Booker Dwyer. It. OK, all right. 
And now to flip things, we will have a presentation to discuss the lumber, building supplies, <laughs> and related <laughs> products contract. So I think Ms. Shea and Ms. Fisher are available to answer our questions about this one. So it's just me, Ms. Fisher's not here, okay. but okay, yes, okay. Um, we'll go to the next slide. So as I'm sure you know, we have many programs in our career and technical education program pathways. Um, that uses lumber. And so we have a contract that we will be bringing to the contracts committee to allow us to procure um, lumber products ranging from standard lumber to some of the higher end lumber um, as necessary. It includes specific lumber like two by fours and two by sixes that we use for framing and stuff in some of our construction trades, but it also includes some of the plywood that might be used for smaller projects in a range of our um, programs. Um, we are in some of our programs beginning the construction of tiny homes, and so we do also use this contract to um, purchase those starters. So if you go to the next slide, it spells out a little bit more about the specific programs of study. Um, so each year our CTE programs of study receive consumable funds that they can use to purchase the materials that they use as part of their program of study. This particular contract supports a wide range of lumber and plywood um, of various sizes and um, weights that supports our building and construction technology programs, carpentry, construction design and management, as well as some of our mechanical construction, PLTW engineering, and advanced tech ed, which is in many of our comprehensive schools. Next slide. And as I mentioned already, the way that we would implement this funding, we do provide a consumable budget that schools um, spend against based on the programs themselves, the anticipated cost, and then we do um, monitor that cost. This same contract may also be used through the Office of Facilities, um, but we're bringing it forward because there's a curricular implication as well. Next slide. And then in terms of um, evaluating it for a program uh, for contracts of this type of materials for consumables, we certainly work closely, as I mentioned, through um, every school and program for the CTE teachers um, and the CTE office. We also monitor costs, um, as I'm sure you can imagine, following the pandemic. We did see a lot of challenges with pricing with some of these construction materials, which I'm sure you saw just in uh, real life as well. That seems to have regulated, but we do work collaboratively with our folks in purchasing when we start to see that happen or if we had any concerns about at one point we also saw um, some challenges with supply chains. Uh, we are in a much better place now but we do monitor that in terms of evaluating the effectiveness of a contract that we use to purchase materials for instruction or construction as the case may be. <laughs> okay next slide I think that's it that's it. So this is um, an awareness about a contract that's coming. And so I um, wanted to give you a heads up about the curricular implication for our CTE program. So I welcome any questions that you might have. Board members, any questions about this contract? Okay, so is this coming? Should we take um, a vote on this now, Ms. Shea? Okay. Yes, the procurement, um, the contract sheet will show whether or not it comes with the endorsement. I don't know that you have to vote to approve it, but Gypsy, were you just going to clarify that? Yes, they do need to approve it to okay. move it forward. Yeah, so then it comes with the recommendation of the curriculum or the approval of the curriculum committee as part of procurement. It is going to contracts next week. Okay, so do I have a motion to approve the lumber building supplies and related products contract as presented? So moved, so moved Booker Dwyer. <laughs> Whoa, we got lots. Okay, so I got so moved Booker Dwyer and thank you. And then I think Ms. Stileski, you seconded or? Sure. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, can we have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Stileski? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The motion or the contract passes. OK, next on the agenda is the support math tutoring program. Um, and for that, I think we have several people, correct? You um, have me and you have uh, Miss Machinda again. OK, because that one was not on my script. So that's why I'm kind of ad-libbing right now. OK, yeah, so, so go ahead. Um, 
we had several tutoring contracts that were overlapping and sometimes that can be um, a challenge. So I'm going to open an intro and then I will certainly turn it over to Ms. Mshinda. You may remember from the press release, Maryland offered an opportunity for local education authorities to apply for a math tutoring grant. Um, the grant opportunity was very specific about how we might use it and Baltimore County was one of, I believe, initially only three LEAs that were awarded this math tutoring grant, which is very exciting. The purpose of this grant from MSCE, it's a very short-lived grant. It is the last gasp of some of the um, ESSER funding, um, but the purpose was um, essentially startup money to get us started with building our own infrastructure for high quality in school day tutoring. And so I'm emphasizing uh, two of those pieces. Oftentimes in the past, tutoring has included things like after school opportunities um, or Saturday. What MSCE is really encouraging um, LEAs through this grant to do is to follow the research which says that in school day tutoring has a significant impact because it eliminates some of the other barriers that can happen when you move tutoring to being outside that school day. And so the funds are designed to help us create an infrastructure and the grant um, also expected us to develop partnerships with institutes for higher education. So what we're going to bring forward tonight are some of the contracts that will be coming forward to support this grant, um, but we wanted the opportunity at Curriculum Committee to tell you a little bit more about what we're going to do with it. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Mshinda and ask you to go to the next slide. Thank you, it's Ms. Mshinda. So I think actually um, Ms. Shea talked through a little bit of this, the overarching pieces of the grant. Um, the fact that this activity comes from our award uh, through the Maryland Tutoring Corps grant, which is asking us to create our own pipeline of high impact school day tutoring, specifically in the middle school and specifically with partnerships um, that are higher uh, higher ed partnerships. So our partners will be UMBC um, in year one, and then we'll bring in Towson, and at the same time include some BCPS students so that this becomes something that becomes like a, a part of our um, infrastructure. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So how this will be implemented. Over the course of three years, we're hoping to scale up first in implementation and then in impact. So in year one, we are going to do tutoring at one school to a targeted group of 40 eighth grade students. We're going to use UMBC's program that's already established called Reach Together um, to sort of guide what this could look like in BCPS. So UMBC will work with one school, 40 students, tutoring at a minimum of three times a week at no less than 30 minutes each time or each session. They'll develop relationships and mentorships with the students and the same tutor, same student will work together for the entire length of the program, which we're starting in March 1, the anticipated start date, so that we carry us all the way through the spring in something of maybe a nine to 12 week program. Um, in year two, we will try to replicate this by bringing in Towson, including three additional schools with 40 students targeted at eighth grade for those three schools. The idea is to take what we learned in year one, make improvements over the summer around implementation and bring Towson in to engage the additional schools. In year three, we will be established at four schools. We'll have the infrastructure. We'll be looking to include BCPS students and scale up the number of students receiving tutoring at each of the four schools. So now 80 students at each of the four schools targeted still in grade eight um, to receive the tutoring. And our focus on grade eight was data based. Look at our data. This said grade eight was the space to to focus in on on this kind of tutoring. Um, the next slide. So we are going to do this so that we can create something that is sustainable in BCPS. That is the full goal. Um, it is a direct alignment to the blueprint that asks about how we supply or support school day tutoring for students. So we will be building this infrastructure to address the blueprint and to address the needs of the students in grade eight. Um, the professional learning will be aligned to the needs of the grant. So tutors will receive initial ongoing, initial and ongoing professional learning around not just content, but relationships, mentorships, and working with students. 
along with the teachers receiving professional learning on any of the platforms that are used to provide the curricular resource during the tutoring. The next slide. We're going to evaluate this in many ways. So we're going to first look at the students. How are they changing both in disposition and in achievement? We're going to look at partnership meetings. How are our relationships with our uh, IHE partners going? And the tutors, uh, we're going to have quarterly reviews of the data. We're going to also have an annual retreat where we get together with the Towson College of Ed research team to really look at all of the data points along the way to see where we can make improvements and how the tutoring has impacted uh, student achievement over time. I think that may be it. The next I do slide. want to add one more one more piece that's super exciting that will. So part of, as I mentioned, the funding from Merrill, uh, from MSDE was about startup funds, if you can imagine. How do you build the infrastructure? So, you know, the initial impact of the number of students might seem small, but the purpose is teaching us as an organization how to stand up an infrastructure for in school tutoring. And so in the future, we also anticipate um, in year two, part of what UMBC does so, so well and has an established program is they actually hire students to serve as tutors as part of their pathway. We have a vision of doing something similar with our CTE students as an apprenticeship so that we can also create a pipeline for how do we model off of this established program that they've had in place at UMPC, but create that infrastructure that we can hire students in an apprenticeship pathway um, who may have a future in mathematics, may have a future in education, who could then become a part of a grow your own pipeline, um, or may have any um, number of interests in pursuing um, that pathway for working with students. So um, part of what we're also investing Investing in is teaching um, BCPS staff how to develop that infrastructure for sustainability over time so that at some point we hope to have something like this in house that we can apply across the system um, in every school. So that's another exciting piece that's built into some of the partnership with both UMBC and Towson is also about working to support the adults to create those pipelines for students. That's it. Thank any you. <laughs> Anybody have any questions about the um, math tutoring presentation? Ms. Pumphrey does. I have I think a question. Oh. Uh, yes, just a quick question. I uh, My question is about the students in the schools. How are the students being chosen for this program? And also when we get into the second year with four schools, how are we deciding which schools these programs are being implemented? So in year one, one of the, the components of UMBC that make their tutoring program so strong is that they only do face-to-face -face tutoring. And so part of what they requested was to work with a school where their students could go from campus to the site. And so the first year we are looking in that Southwest region so that we are close to UMBC students, that they're able to get to and from and engage in whatever the schedule is at, at the school. Um, are we are we announcing the school? Um, we we can certainly share that our goal right now. We haven't met with the the um, staff yet, but we have identified Woodlawn Middle. So the intersectionality, besides uh, geographic, was also looking at um, assessment data and school need, and partnership with a strong leadership. Um, so we've been working in partnership with our executive directors in the Department of School um, to help. And so we've identified several schools that had interest. We've had some conversations with different building leaders because you also have to make sure that the school has the infrastructure in terms of scheduling to make that happen. And so that was um, some of the data points. So proximity to UMBC, student achievement data mathematics, uh, infrastructure support within the school, whether through scheduling or leadership as well. Um, so, so that's where um, we are with that. And then moving forward, similarly, we will use um, uh, assessment data. So as you know from our math achievement data, we have several schools that we could certainly go into support. Um, so we will prioritize that while having some effort to be more spread out as we internally are able to build sustainability and aren't limited by that geographic region. So then same thing, we'll work with our partners in the Department of School to collaboratively identify based on achievement data, based on having a range across the county, how do we scale it from that one to four to represent the different corners, if you will, um, of our system. For Identifying the students, we identified several data points. Um, Ms. Machine, did you want to talk about some of the data points we identified to screen the students? Yeah, so we looked at the MAP data 
and specifically in the beginning writing of the grant, we're looking at map data for seventh grade. So we're anticipating we're working with grade eight students. So we looked at where seventh grade students were in their growth. We looked at MCAP data, which we've seen, and it's very clear about all the domains where students could receive additional support. Um, and we're looking at disposition. So we're hoping to grow students efficacy around mathematics. And this is what's going to be so important about the school leadership being a part of selecting the students. There may be more than 40 students who could benefit from this this opportunity. They're going to look for the 40 students who could benefit and show gains by participating in this kind of a relationship with a tutor so that they build efficacy. They're building their um, ability to do mathematics. They are um, seeing gains in their experiences in the classroom because this will happen during the school day, but not during the class time. Right. So this is another piece where they, what, what they're gaining from that experience with their tutor should show up in their experiences and, and progress in the classroom. I would also add to that, um, many of our schools are identified as um, TSI schools for a specific population. In some cases, that's students receiving services for special education, and many others, it's our multilingual learners. So that's another data point and prioritizing those um, student groups. And then also another data point is attendance. The in-school day tutoring is only going to be as effective as you are in school. And so we want to use it both as an opportunity to see who's going to likely benefit, but also as an incentive to help increase um, students who um, that's an incentive for the student and their family to understand the importance of, of being at school. So that's another data point that we're using to help identify students in addition to the one Ms. Imshinda identified. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Other board member questions? Um, this is Mrs. Stileski. Go ahead, Ms. Um, I have Lewis. a question. OK, thank you. Um, this sounds like a really exciting opportunity, and I love the intention to make it sustainable for the future. Um, I know that the ESSER funding will obviously run out. So um, is there a like a plan in place in terms yes, of being able to continue to fund it? Because it does sound like a really important intervention. So, Thank you. So that that is a great question, Mrs. Salsky. And in fact, it was a requirement of the grant. So when I mentioned earlier that in the entire state, only three LEAs were awarded the grant, part of that was because it was a very I have to take an opportunity to praise Ms. Mshinda. It was an impossibly short turnaround <laughs> and she did an incredible job. Um, but a second part of that was a commitment to a match. And so you had to commit as a, as a superintendent and as a school system that you were going to have system dollars that would match the grant award so that you could have sustainability. And so um, probably about a week after Dr. Rogers assumed her role, we had a meeting with her to say, we have about three weeks. Do you want us to go for it? Because we need to know as you're building your budget, is this something you want to commit to? And she was resolute that this was something she wanted to commit to. So it's required in the grant that we have to have a plan. Um, we're allowed to flood the beginning with grant funds because ESSER is ending. So it's not the match isn't happening every year match to match. We actually flood most of the grant funds first, but you did have to commit to having those system operating dollars for sustainability. That's great. This is really exciting. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other questions? So um, most of my questions were asked by my colleagues. Um, do do the tutors get paid or are, is it part of their programming at the university? They get paid. OK, and then um, how are we going to give um, principals ideas about scheduling? So I know you said it won't take them out of their math courses, but if it's in school, where it where will it fit in? And what's the frequency of the, the times that they get tutored? The um, frequency is a minimum of three days a week for at least 30 minutes. Um, we know that a lot of the research talks about pivot points. So there is some research to say the 90 minute is the threshold and that there are some some argument, especially with an AB rotation, that it could be 245 or 330. But the basic target is that 90 minutes a week. Part of the conversations we've been having with principals is about not pulling them out of math class um, because that wouldn't be supplemental. Many of all of our middle schools offer an advisory period. They look slightly differently depending on how they are managed, but that's one very um, 
likely place where something like this would fit in. Um, we do also have some schools that um, utilize AVID um, as well as Effective Habits for a College and Career. Those are two courses that are designed to help students develop and strengthen skills in literacy and mathematics. So that would be another opportunity within the schedule, within a student schedule. Um, AVID includes tutorials as part of the curriculum, for example. So those are two other options for how we could build it into the school day without compromising instruction time in uh, those core areas. Okay, thank you. And my other question was through, uh, during the um, voiceover PowerPoint, I heard I ready a couple times. <laughs> yep. Is that so, I ready old or just a different I ready? Like it, it is only the screener. So the grant requires that you use an external screener for the beginning and end. Um, so Ms. Machina, do you want to talk about um, how that was one of the ones that was approved to identify? Yes, <clears throat> so again, UMBC has their Reach Together program and they are already using iReady, but um, exactly as Ms. Shea mentioned, it is just the, the diagnostic screener so that they have a pre-assessment and a post-assessment. What they do is they protect tutoring time so the students won't be assessed any other time during tutoring. All the tutoring time will go to mathematics, to relationship, building and mentorship and they assess in the beginning and then we assess at the end to see how they're doing. Other pieces of that will happen formatively with the tutors, um, but iReady was selected uh, by them as a, a tool that they are already working with and that we are familiar with that has uh, an AI diagnostic and will place those students right where they are. Okay, I think it's just important that as we go forth and message this that we make sure that people understand the use of iReady if it comes out and if they have any prior knowledge? Historical of, knowledge, yep. Just okay. the screener and just because UMBC had that as part of the program that we're seeking to replicate and learn right. from. No, and I, I um, echo my colleague when it's in, it's very exciting and the whole idea of building it, um, the infrastructure and going slow um, seems really um, worthwhile. And could we get a periodical update um, on the progress as you continue to move forward? Okay, any other we questions? We'd love to celebrate it. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so is this a contract? Do I need to get a motion? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. so we are um, looking for a motion to approve the support math tutoring initiative. So move Say that again, somebody? It was me, so move Pumphrey, sorry. No, no, it's okay. Thank you, it's the virtual nature. Um, may I have a second, please? Second still asking. Thank you. Ms. Kaxer, roll call vote, please. Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Dolowski? Yes. Thank you. Thank so you. motion passes. Thank you. Next, I think, is another very exciting presentation for research for better teaching. And for that, we have Ms. Lagaman and Ms. Demimo. And Dr. Jones will be getting them started. And Dr. Jones, sorry. Hi, hi, Ms. Lichter. Hi, hi everyone. Um, board chair, wait, let me just start again. Board chair. No, um, committee chair, committee chair. Committee chair, committee chair, <laughs> Lichter. And um, mm -hmm. vice chair, I want to make sure I get everyone um, straight. This is my first time on curriculum committee, so bear with me. Um, but I am excited to be here amongst um, all of you. We are here. Um, this is actually a contract, so it's interesting that it's coming through curriculum committee. But I think the team thought it was important for you all to understand that the research for better teaching um, contract and approach is really going to help us as we improve best practices around curriculum and instruction. And so um, Heather Lagerman is here to kind of share some of the pieces. As you all know, our data, um, MCAP data and other data points have suggested that we really take a look at how we are providing um, and increasing teacher quality, improving teacher efficacy, which we know is also a um, data point for teacher retention. So I'll turn it over to um, Ms. Lagerman and we'll answer any questions you have at the end. Thank you. And excited to begin by on the next slide sharing that research for better teaching is in direct alignment with the superintendent's vision and our Department of Organizational Development and Leadership's uh, priority area, as you can see on this slide. 
And the next slide, since 1979, Research for Better Teaching has been committed to the, these beliefs, which are in direct alignment that every child deserves a quality education, regardless of the circumstances of their birth, and that all children are capable of growing to their ability and learning to proficiency. Next slide. As referenced on the slide, the vision for Research for Better Teaching is that we will have knowledgeable educators who believe in children and who are working in schools with strong cultures and structures for professional practice and the company is committed to ensuring the expertise of teachers so that learning occurs for all students. Their mission is that more high expertise teaching for more children in more classrooms more of the time. We love that, more of everything. Next slide. The core programs for Research for Better Teaching include the three listed on this slide. And if you go to the next slide, one of the things we did in the uh, PowerPoint so that you could access that hopefully in advance is all of these are hyperlinked. So you can look at any of the links on here for further information about the overview. But uh, to put it in a nutshell, Research for Better Teaching offers programs for teachers to support their professional growth. Also works with evaluators and school leaders to enhance their individual leadership skills and coaches leaders on strategies for change and procedures that strengthen school culture and organizational effectiveness at all levels. And a few more things on the next slide trains data coaches and data teams, and there's also a wealth of information in books and products and videos, so that's all linked there. And it helps districts build in-house professional development capacity to ensure skillful teaching and implement teacher evalu evaluation systems. So all of that is linked on there, hopefully if you've had a chance to take a look at it. Uh, the other thing on the next slide that we wanna highlight is that Research for Better Teaching elevates and amplifies the teaching and learning framework. And as we all know, the teaching and learning framework identifies and articulates our core beliefs in Baltimore County around teaching and learning. And uh, one of the things that is so impactful about research for better teaching is that it will strengthen our professional learning communities and ensure that we have a shared understanding of what high expertise teaching looks like and how we can leverage it uh, to improve outcomes for students. So we're very excited about the alignment there. And we can, um, skip over I think the next few slides we went into a deep dive with quotes that we've all internalized I know from the teaching and learning framework about leadership so we don't want to read those to you um, but we're really excited about that alignment and um, have had a lot of conversations around um, how that will be impactful as a seamless transition uh, because it is so clearly in alignment with um, not only the vision and mission but our teaching and learning framework core document. So um, now we'll dive in a little bit to what we are proposing here, training for the identified groups. So um, we've worked with the company to identify their system, their um, company services and how they align with our system needs and the cadence of uh, the training. And so you can see that what we're proposing here for the 24-25 school year is to begin with skillful leadership for executive directors and directors, and then to also move on to uh, secondary principles for analyzing teaching for student results. And then last there, a six day um, course entitled skillful, Studying Skillful Teaching, and that's secondary department chairs, as well as consulting teachers, consulting administrators, and or staff development teachers. And on the next slide, the course timeframe there, as you can see, is similar to what we've outlined, but you can see the way we would um, organize the cohorts. One of the things that's important to note is that the seven day and six day time frame do not require consecutive days of attendance. So we would be scheduling those and additional cohorts of secondary principals, department chairs, consulting teachers and consulting administrators and staff development teachers would be able to commence in October and January of 2025. And on the next slide, additional services that are included in the quote involve site visits for each principal enrolled in the course and an in-district instructor program that includes training of six leaders as IDIs, as the abbreviation will have a new acronym, for future course offerings, where one of the things we're very excited about is uh, how much they want to get to know us and our principals and our leaders and be a part of the fabric of what we're doing, make sure that it is relevant and aligned. Next slide. With an understanding of the fiscal implications, we would like to evaluate the implementation to determine additional offerings. So we envision an impactful and productive partnership during the 24-25 school year, and then we will continue in subsequent years, hopefully to provide training. We will provide training for all elementary principals and teachers and anticipate collaborating to review and revise the teacher evaluation system to ensure that teachers develop and grow as contributing members of BCPS. So we do have a long range plan beyond 24-25 uh, once we've 
evaluated and analyzed the impact of our work together uh, during what we are proposing here in the year and three months. And the last part was just to leave you on the last slide with this quote from John Safir uh, that we really liked. High expertise teachers believe that every one of their children can truly learn to proficiency despite the conditions of their birth and that they can get them there. So now open it up for questions or any um, final remarks from Dr. Jones before we open it for questions. We can take any questions at this, at this time. Thanks, Heather. Sure. Questions from board members? Um, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Who has a question? Uh, I, Maggie, Ms. Dominowski, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Ms. Dominowski. Um, I know we've talked about this with professional development in the past. What are um, the checks and balances uh, as far as doing the the seven day and the six day training with the professionals early on and what they're bringing back with them and implementing in the school um how are i know you, you talked about in the, a year there's analysis but is there analysis that happens sooner than that absolutely we plan to be reflective and analyze along the way and that's part of why um, it doesn't have to be done all in one you know um consecutive sequence so that we're allowed for that reflection time in between and to provide feedback. They've been very responsive about wanting to know what works, what does not work for our context. And so we definitely plan to do that um, through each meeting. Is there like a, a, a survey already like ready to go or some kind of, I mean, is there something already ready for um, teachers or um, board chairs, principals, directors? Is there something already ready to go for them to fill out once they've gone through the training course or once they've gone through the professional development? Yes, yeah, so I can answer. Uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Heather. Go ahead, Dr. Jones. Sorry. No, I was going to say we, we are still in the um, the preliminary stages and phases phases of this. Um, and I think what, what you were going to say, Heather, once this is approved, then we will begin thinking about what this actually will look like and mean for, um, for our for our teachers and and for our um for our leaders what we don't want this to become is something that is just kind of um a canned opportunity but we really want to kind of get feedback early on which is what's going to happen um to be able to drive the process and to answer your earlier question with us trying to kind of think about how research for better teacher teaching aligns with our needs and, and being able to provide the pedagogical aspects of the work for teachers, we will be able to analyze um, and reflect and really think about how all of this is coming together as it relates to our classroom observations, our supports to schools. We want it to be a part of what um, the expectations are for our teachers as it relates to their work with their work with students. So um, some of those pieces have not been completely um, completely ironed out, but we did, um, Heather and her team did do a survey or conduct a survey about the professional development needs. I don't know, Heather, if you want to talk about that at all. Sure, we did do a professional learning survey and we were really excited to have over 700 participants in that. So um, one of the things that um, came out of that is people really wanted um, something more streamlined. They gave a lot of, of uh, professional development advice on what they would like in future uh, PD. Um, some of the things, one of the things that's nice is it did uh, reflect us. I've got my 764 respondents from 75 schools and a lot of the things that it listed are part of what we would be looking at with research for better teaching as far as differentiated opportunities, um, listing a variety of different things that they would like to have more information on for instructional practice and uh, having an opportunity to have a system wide level set and foundation. So um, you've got a lot of information Thanks, from there that we're going to share as well um, if this is approved with the, with the company to make sure that it's embedded in the way that we handle the professional development. Thank you for that. Well, I Thank have you. a question. Go ahead. So this was a great presentation, so thank you for this. And I, my question gets back to just the accountability for teachers and principals um, implementing this. Is there a vision to, in, to begin to incorporate elements of this into the formal evaluation process? So I, so I can answer that. I think so a couple of things. I, I think the intention would be to make sure that what teachers are evaluated on is aligned to 
the professional development and the level setting around research for better for better teaching right now um, it is my understanding and anyone on the call whose staff can help me is that we are working from um, Danielson's framework as it relates to as it relates to that work so there are definitely opportunities um, to create alignment and that I, I would I would think that would be the ultimate the ultimate goal but this is actually this is kind of one of those things too that where it is there are components and 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 things that teachers should be doing but my experience having been trained in this many 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 years ago it's it's also a, a philosophy it's a mindset it's a it, there are approaches that can be used but ultimately yes we want to kind of move um, our teachers into a space of of using this and then of course we always want evaluation to be aligned with what it is that they're getting from a professional development standpoint. Absolutely, and that's one of the beautiful things um, is they, they do have already um, a crosswalk and alignment between Danielson um, and Research for Better Teaching that is structured particularly for evaluation. So that was also something that was very appealing about this um, is that once the PD is completed, like Dr. Jen says, then that's part of this gradual transition that we will be looking at doing to evaluation alignment and uh, make sure that we develop that using that crosswork uh, for a smooth transition. That's helpful, thank you. Other questions from board members? Hi, this is Ms. Stolesky. Go ahead, Ms. Stolesky. Thank you. Um, um, in terms of this program, um, one of the things that I'm just thinking about is all of the different trainings that teachers are required to fulfill. Um, so I'm assuming that in some way, shape or form, this is going to involve um, some kind of learning for teachers. So how can you explain the rationale for this? Just given how kind of overworked and overburdened teachers are currently feeling to make, you know, to help make us understand that this is something really purposeful and useful that will um, benefit the students in the long run. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank you. That's a really good question. So what what our intention is, and I think it may have been shared in the slides, our intention is to really begin with those of us who are providing support to schools. So it's going to begin with leaders first, executive leadership, and then principals first, so that it's not this kind of like mid-year put upon in terms of the um in terms of the teachers. But one of the things that we're hoping to do um, as we are in the process of really even th rethinking our professional development plan for um, new and existing teachers and, su and supporting teachers as it relates to um, effective feedback, our leaders need to also sharpen their lens around what the look fors are and what is needed in the classroom. But then also, we're going to kind of steep this in, in our data. We're going to steep it in our data and we're going to really think about the fact that we know that our our um, state assessments are not where we need them to be. We know that some of our some of our teachers really want to do well um, and really want to improve their efficacy around the work. And, and so we're going to really kind of frame this as an opportunity to make sure that we are all doing what is needed, what is needed for students. But we are starting off in a gradual way with our executive leadership with the principals and then working our way, um, working our way to be able to have more and more uh, people on board to be able to send the message that this is something that not only we need to improve academic achievement, but meets the needs of our students and can create greater even job satisfaction for our teachers and the work that they do. And just Thank to you. add on, on to that, one of the things that's been wonderful is we have um, shared with teacher, the Teacher Effectiveness Committee and TAPCO is a part of that and they are excited and in, in full support of uh, moving in this direction. They're, they're very thrilled. So that's one of the things we tried to do to make sure we had that, um, that initial engagement and interest in it as well. We shared the professional learning survey results, uh, teacher effectiveness too. And so there was a great interest and enthusiasm. That's good to hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't look on the contract. How much is the contract for? So the contract, the spending authority is for $627,125. Okay, and is that for one year or is that over time? That's for one year and three months. And that starting, includes everything that's in the presentation. Okay, so that will be starting this spring to next, right. next through the next school year? Yes, it would end June 30th, 2025. 
Okay, but it would start with when you said their executive staffs being trained this, this spring. spring. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's more than a 12 year contract, 12 month contract. Right, it's one year, three months, yes. Okay. Um, okay, and then, um, okay, I think my other questions were answered. Any other questions from um, board members? Okay, hearing none, may I have a motion to approve the contract for research for better teaching? So move Stileski. Thank you, is there a second? Second, Dominique. Um, I just wanna check, is there any further discussion before we vote on this one? Because it seemed a little hesitant there. Okay, may we have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Cox? Ms. Lichter? Yes. Ms. Pumphrey? Yes. Ms. Booker Dwyer? Yes. Ms. Dominowski? Yes. Ms. Stolowski? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Contract passes. Next on the agenda is an update on our elementary. Um, ELA curriculum and our secondary ELA pilot and we have a lot of people online to um <laughs> I keep getting getting wrong who I say but I'll try it we have Ms. Shea, Dr. Kraft, Dr. Wolf and Ms. not Ms. Wicks isn't here we have those three and Dr. DiDonato available Yes, so I am going to definitely um, turn it over to the team because this is a very thorough presentation that we tried to merge together two big topics for you um both where we are progressing with HMH into reading um, at our elementary level, as well as um, the field tests that we're conducting in our um, middle and high schools with um, HMH into literature, literacy. And so with that, I will turn it over to the group. You can go to the next slide. Go ahead, Dr. Kraft and Dr. Wolf. Okay, um so thank you for having us this evening. This is very exciting because part of our professional learning plan for HMH and the implementation plan was to have job embedded coaching from an HMH consultant at each school. Um, and so far, all but three of our elementary schools have had a full day of coaching with uh, into reading HMH, Hooten Mifflin coach. Um, and those three are actually rescheduled for next week because due to the weather. These are the bullets that principals got to actually select what the focus of that professional learning would be. So it could be very strategically developed and focused for what the teachers in that building need and even specific to the grade level. Um, it has been overwhelmingly positive by both administrators and teachers. Next slide, please. Um, this is a, just an a example of all the different resources available within HMH into reading, specifically for responsive instruction. And for quarter two, our focus with teacher leaders, reading specialists, and staff development teachers has been to focus on how do you navigate all these resources and plan for responsive instruction using the data that they're getting from AMIRA and from instruction. Um, and so you can see that from the beginning of the unit all the way through the unit, there are supports in place for our multilingual learners, students with IEPs, and also our advanced academic students. So we can enhance and enrich their curriculum experience as well. Next slide, please. Um, this is one of the examples of a ELA tabletop mini lesson. And the nice thing about these is they um, are aligned to all the different skills and standards through each grade level and their tests text agnostic so teachers can use them multiple times throughout a um, throughout the year as needed and, and they differentiate support based on whether the student needs substantial support moderate or light support um, and it focuses on both the reading and writing connection and how that skill inter inter intertwines between both reading and writing to learn next slide please HMH into reading is built around the idea of it's a background knowledge building curriculum and that is that is rooted in the science of reading. So it, each module is around an essential question and a theme and the UN module kicks off with a very engaging video to introduce the topic. There's vocabulary targeted throughout the module with support picture support cards for our learners. 
And then knowledge maps, as you can see there, they're designed to be interactive. So as the students are reading different texts and writing about that knowledge, that topic, teachers are building on and adding vocabulary, adding ideas, thoughts to that knowledge map. So students, students have those as an anchor chart as well. It's also one of our really strong resources for our English language learners. Next slide, please. Dr. Kraft, this is your slide, I believe. Um, are we going to show this or because we put it in ahead of time? I'm, I'm very cognizant can, of time right yeah, now. Yeah, time. Like we can do. Yeah, you have a link to this, which is the Mira yeah. update in the presentation. It's a little Mira update talking about the parents, um, teachers, um, principal, administrator perspectives. Um, and then I'll quickly do these two slides and then turn it right back over to Dr. Wolf. And so um, we are about 14 weeks in um, from the, the first time that we screened using Amira, which is one of our two approved screeners um, that we are piloting this year. Um, and so what we just wanted to show you is, um, and at this point we only had about 10,000 of our students screened, so it's not everybody, but we wanted to give you a live update of um, what we're seeing in terms of growth. And so Amira has national averages of around what we expect students to be able to grow within a period of time. So about one week of growth for one week of instruction, right? So be, if you we think about that, there have been 14 weeks between between when we first screened and our middle of the year screening, um, you would see that red line. And that red line is showing that 14 weeks um, of instructional growth that we would expect for students to be making. We then have the next line, which is blue, um, labeled as low usage. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. And then the top line is green. That's our high usage. And so how Amira is defining this is high usage means that you are getting that minimum of 30 minutes a week um, that is shown to have the, the strongest efficacy in the research and that you're doing approximately about eight stories um, over eight weeks of time. And so if you had hit that over the 14 weeks, you would fall into that high usage category. So students that are using Amira with high usage dosage uh, have grown approximately 33.89 weeks in 14 weeks. Um, for students that are low usage, which would mean less than those eight stories, or maybe they didn't have eight weeks out of the 14 where they were hitting that 30 minute, they would fall into the low usage. However, most of our students are getting close. Our average is about 20 minutes. So we do know that our students are getting, um, there's not a lot of students just sitting around with zero minutes of practice usage. Um, next slide. And so just to show it to you a different way, this is actually percentile. And so what we see is that students, um, again, using Amira, Amira um, based on either that low usage and high usage, we are getting an average um, of about a four percentile gain for low usage. But for high usage students since the beginning of the year, we're seeing a 11 percentile gain. Um, and so again, this will be, this data is not final because we didn't have our entire data set, but we just wanted to give you a snapshot of uh, and an update of what is happening with um, Amira being used as a practice. Next slide. Uh, this slide actually shows what a parent, the part of what a parent report looks like, and this is a kindergarten student. And what you'll see here is the Amira progress. Amira reports progress using an ARM score, which is Amira reading mastery, and 0.1 of equals one month of growth. This student started at zero for her ARM score back in September 19th, and at, after four months of instruction, this student is now on track in decoding phonological awareness, high frequency words and vocabulary, and they're now performing at um, seven months of growth, seven months of school after four months of instruction. Um, next slide, please. The bottom of the parent report then sends specific recommendations for reading at home and how to support that child, specifically based on their AMIRA practice and their AMIRA assessment. So it's very user friendly for the parent to interact with at home. Next slide, please. 
This is a third grade student, and this student in the beginning of the year was scoring was at about a second, about second grade. Um, their arm score was 2.35, and they are now reading equivalent to 3.02 mid year. So again, this student has made some significant growth just in four months of school, and you can see she's also that they also are considered on track for meeting the benchmark of the sub scores um, across Amira. Um, with the practice. Um, Dr. Wolf, I'm just going to um, interject really quickly. Um, and what I really want to talk about is um, HMH has been, and Amira have been extremely responsive to our feedback. And so the first reports that we sent, these are different than the parent reports we sent home at the beginning of the year that were not nearly as detailed. We then met with um, the company several times and talked about what we would really need <coughs> know exactly how their students are performing and as a result of that collaboration uh, that is what you're seeing right now are the new reports where it really breaks out all the sub scores and explains um, how they can support their students at home, which included some vocabulary change. So the first time that we had some of those parent reports, some of the um, reports had a lot of educational jargon. And what you will see now is that it really is very family friendly um, in, in service of students. And next slide, please, which is another example of that parent reporting and how this student, this specific student, the tips and recommendations for reading at home match the level of progress where they are right now in student achievement um, in read and learning to read. Next slide, please. Um, and then this is just the overall what the parent report looks like, and it sort of is that anatomy of a parent report. And this was the revised report that Dr. Kraft shared. Um, it explains the ARM score for parents, progress over time, um, percentiles of the different subscores, and then tips for helping their child at home. And Pam, just in case, I know that um, we're trying to go quick, but I just want to I just want to talk really quickly. Each of those dots is a practice session. And so when you see more practice sessions, what we're seeing again is that high usage, we're getting the high growth. And so it's also really quick. So for these students that we're seeing really nice progress, um, and in fact, it would be what we would call accelerated progress. You're also seeing that they are also putting substantial practice sessions in. I'm um, sorry, back to you, Dr. Wolf. Next slide, please. Um, part of using a mirror right now is we're able to I, look you at know data. what, Dr. Wolf, we can skip over this. I, skip they saw it. Yeah, we can we can okay. skip both these slides. Oh, and I think that ends my um, oh, uh, I wanted to share feedback. Yes. So this is really this is also very powerful for us as an office. And as, um, we sent out a survey to all teachers in quarter one, grades K to five and administrators and teacher leaders. It was an anonymous survey um, as far as implementation of um, HMH. And what you'll see here is that some of the successes we heard were teachers really the coaching piece and that consultant being with them at home. Um, teachers are really embracing the vocabulary. They're loving the vocabulary cards and the implementation of building that background for our students and the resources. There's so much available to select from in instruction. Um, challenges which we've sort of anticipated were pacing. It's new and it's taking a little bit longer to get through and figuring it out all the resources. Um, that's a, both a blessing and a curse sometimes. Um, writing, managing writing, there's much more of an emphasis of writing um, in HMH than we've ever had before, which was one of our needs based on data. And the rigor, it is, there is our high expectations with that grade level text, text, um, text um, standard based instruction. Um, and with the reading and writing of fitting that all in in the day. Next slide, please. And you can see similar um, feedback from our teacher leader and administrators. The coaching, the te teachers feeling more comfortable now using HMH, but again, those challenges of pacing and planning um, that we've heard through quarter one as one of the struggles. Next slide, please. We've also met with teachers face to face for focus groups, so they've had a chance to fill in both that anonymous survey and then also to come together to share us because that qualitative data is sometimes more powerful than that agree or not agree. Um, and again, some of the same challenges came back that we saw before. Um, what was very great was um, 
great to hear from teachers was that we we developed as an office module overviews to support pacing and planning and really in helping teachers learn how to use those has made a difference for a lot of the teachers. Next slide, please. Um, and then add really, can I just add really quickly, Pam, sure. an exciting piece that um, we're approaching our one year anniversary. So it was about a year ago that we started our pilot. And so what's exciting about that is there are some teachers who are now starting to teach a unit for the second time. And so part of the feedback that we're anxious to get from teachers is now that you've been around the barn one whole time and you're teaching a unit for the second time, how does that shift? Because that's gonna be really important feedback for us and also to help other teachers. So we have some teachers that are really excited because they're recognizing um, things that they did. They have some familiarity. And so we're anxious to see how that improves pacing and some of the access of the rigor as well. Sorry, Pam, go ahead. No, that was great. And and all of that is also we had a we have a professional learning plan for the year and we knew that we were going to focus on writing third quarter. Um, what's happened through those focus groups that we've really been able to tailor that focus to meet teachers with how do you plan using the HMH resources? How do you the difference between process and on demand writing and understanding the stages of writing and how to support students who are at the beginning writing stage versus those who are more developed writers. So that is we're very excited about that. We've been working on that and we'll have our teacher leaders, reading specialists and staff development teachers come together in quarter three to dig into that work so we can meet teachers where they are. Next slide, please. So before we move to secondary, let's see if there's any questions on the elementary um, update. So board members, any questions on the elementary HMH update? I have some questions. Go ahead, Ms. Demonowski. Thank you. Um, first, how do you have a total of the number of teachers that are students that were involved in the, the feedback? I think you said it was, what, 10,000? Um, for the feedback, I don't have that survey right in front of me at this minute. Um, Ms. Demonowski, just to, sorry, it, um, Dr. Wolf, Mr. Manassi, just to clarify, because you had said students, are you asking about the graph with the student progress or the um, survey yeah. for the teachers? I'm sorry. No, no, I, I, I was confusing there. Yeah, I meant the graph for the students. So how many students were included in that graph at yeah. that time? Okay. Yes, it was approximately 10,000 because that's all the, the students that had been screened. We wanted to bring you the, we didn't want to wait till the end of the window since we had this opportunity to give you an update. So we pulled the most current data, but they actually, our window doesn't actually close because of some of inclement weather. We aren't closing the window until right. February 6th. And um, do you have the breakdown of the students that are, you know, the high use as versus, versus the low use? Um, yes, I um, give me one second. Um, it is uh, uh, well, actually, let me just tell you exactly what it is. I'll get it. Can okay. you ask the next question while I pull that up really quick? Sure. Uh, how are the, the parent sent? The one that I just saw was not what I saw the last time and you did say that it was different. When yeah. were those sent home? They'll be sent home after assessment is finished. So after the window closes on February 6th, they'll be sent home after that. And is there, um, I know I think we've talked about this before too, is there a parent portal on a mirror where they can go in and find this stuff and kind of like how the teachers can go in on their students and see how they're doing? Can parents do that with their kids as well? So parents can absolutely log in with their child and um, sit with them. That's absolutely accessible at home. But not like on their own. Like they couldn't. There isn't a there isn't a separate login that they could do. Maybe while their kid was at school to go check on. No, no there's not. No, they they'd have to um, go through. Yeah, they would have to go through their student. But um, we are constantly working with Amira on feedback, and so that is certainly feedback. I um actually will be meeting with Mary, our our um success partner this week and I can, oh, that's tomorrow, the week's over. Um, I, and I can pass on that feedback to her um, because we, I will say they have been extremely responsive as we have talked about what we need as we get feedback through the focus groups. And, you know, we are listening to our students, our teachers, our administrators, our families, um, and really trying to be responsive to what they need. And to get back to your other question, um, 
uh, in the high usage category, that's 2,331 students. Um, and then the remaining 7,887 students are in the low usage. Now, while I want to say low usage, um, we did do an average of those of the students again that were looking at the assessment and they averaged approximately 20 minutes weekly on Amira. So they still fall into low usage because they're not getting those five stories for eight weeks, um, but but it's not like low usage like zero or two minutes. Uh, and then my other question with that is as far because they're on their devices for that 30 minutes, just for that reason, just for Amira, what are, what are the studies as far as what are the connections? I'm just worried about kids spending too much time on their devices in the and for this they kind of have to because of that. So how, what is the offset? How are we, you know, limiting their screen time in other places as far so as when they're in school? It's a great question. Can I add one thing just to make sure we're clarifying? It's 30 minutes a week. So right. in many classrooms, teachers are doing it for like a 10 minute um session Three times um, a week. Over, yeah. right so in the in the course of their day um the majority of the especially in our primary grades curriculum doesn't rely um on on digital access but relies every student has their own print book in which they're annotating underlining highlighting so the vast majority of the instructional time in the ela block which represents uh nearly half the day, um, especially in the grades that are using Amira, is not using the devices. So, And one thing I would add, Ms. Shay, to that is in every, um, and I have done a lot of visits lately in ELA, um, I have not seen any of them on the computer for no. the reading and writing portion of the lesson. So, uh -huh. Um, but, you know, I think it's something we constantly have to, to inventory. I don't think that, you know, there's one answer we can give you today and say we have it all figured out. But I would say that over the course of the week, you're looking at like five or six minutes a day or 10 minutes three times a week. OK, and the other thing, because I know when we went to visit, all the kids had the same um, headset with the microphone attached. And I, I know that that as like that's helpful. Um, in a lot of cases and how can we some kids don't have that some classrooms aren't given that option or their their parents will get them one and it's cheaper than the other one so there's a different it's so they're not getting a mirror the same way and how do how do we fix that how do we make it more universal more you know consistent Sure. I mean, it's a great question and I really appreciate that you're seeking equity of, of access because I do think that students um, experience is increased. I can share with you that, especially as Dr. Kraft mentioned in our visits, a lot of school leaders are in the same place. This is the time of the year where they start thinking about um, funds that they had held in reserve in case um, there was a, a problem and how are they going to spend up funds. And I've had actually several leaders um, identify that that's something that they were interested in using. Um, to supplement headsets that were already purchased for something like map testing, but to make sure they had the microphone. So I know our school leaders are thinking about that. I know that they're thinking about it in many of our Title I schools. Um, I heard last week of one PTA. So this is a great forum as people are listening or as you're um, talking with parents. I heard one school where that was something the PTA had identified as a priority. Um, and certainly, as you all well know, with the fiscal realities, we're constantly talking about challenges and, and opportunities to, to leverage funds. So um, it's an ongoing conversation. Of course, you know, I want to also reiterate, but I'm sure I'll get emails. Um, it does still work without the headset. It does make it, um, you, uh, it does require that you have to sort of ensure the environment is more conducive, which is a challenge, right? So the, the headset and the microphone makes it much more um, accessible for multiple kids to be doing without that distraction, but it is trained to have that close point pickup. It just would require students having the ability to like move to a corner of the room or turn their desk. Um, so it's not, it's certainly not as um, great as the headset, but it does still work. But to your point, we're having lots of conversations of different ways to leverage different funding sources to support that. Thank you. Um, and yeah. how did you get a number of the teacher response? That was my other question too about the um, the survey results from teachers. Do you know how about how many teachers you heard from, and you know who was involved? How many teachers were involved in the focus groups? What grade levels? What schools? That kind of thing. Was it like all yeah. over? Um, Dr. Wolf, I think is looking for the survey right now, or maybe she already found it. But oh, I'll yeah. start. With 
uh, I will start with the focus group because we had almost 100% of participation from schools because we um, had representatives from multiple grade levels. At a minimum, most of the time it was a primary and an intermediate and some schools sent a one person from each grade level because we were able to ca capture it through our teacher leader core professional learning. Um, and we actually told them ahead of time that we were doing it. So we were like, talk to your teacher team and bring back all the feedback. And so we're really excited in terms of focus groups. And I have to tell you, I've done a lot of focus groups over my years in education. This is probably the most robust response that we've been able to have. And I, it was not, I'm not going to say it was 100%, but we were very close to 100% of school participation and multiple teachers at different grade levels. And, and as far as the survey goes that teachers were able to do anonymously, we only had 664 responses, which is still better than some of the other surveys that we've sent out in the past. Um, we, we sent it out through Schoology. We sent it out through Reading Specialist. We sent it out actually multiple times and even extended the window. So we did get a couple hundred more when we did that. Um, we'll send another one out um, mid-year. Thank you. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad that you you posted you are addressing some of the challenges and you, you let us know. I've, I've heard some of those things, too, as far as the resources being abundant and that kind of being an issue. And how are I mean, how are we addressing the, the challenges immediately? Yeah, great question um, in a very multifaceted way. Um, and so one of the things that bubbled up, so we'll start with writing. Um, so writing bubbled up a lot. Um, and so one of the things we're doing, and we had already planned to do it through Teacher Leader Core, but what it did was refine what we were doing um, in terms of our professional learning plan. Um, the other thing that you mentioned, and I agree with you, there is an abundance of resources, which is, is not a bad, we would never think that's a bad thing, right? Um, however, it does require very intentional planning. And so we have been working on a planning protocol um, and we're actually getting ready to field test it, not to overuse the field test word, but um, <laughs> to get feedback on some schools that we already know have very strong planning protocols and, and structures in place uh, to say, how do we say, here are the targeted um, priority standards for this unit, back mapping that in intersectionality with my student data, what is it that I'm going to prioritize in each lesson to get my students where they need to go? And I think that's 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 really what it is, is that there are so many good resources because it's a national curriculum. They don't know the students that are sitting in front of each teacher. And so part of how we're going to support our teachers is through that intentional decision making process through planning and backward mapping. I just want to really quickly add to um, Dr. Kraft, that was also a big um, popular ask of those HMH coaching visits. So mm -hmm. when the coaching visits you saw on that list, the idea of planning, that's a lot of what they did for teachers. So these are experts who know the curriculum very well, and they would sit in collaborative planning and they would tell teachers, these are my favorite resources. These are my go to resources. We got a lot of positive feedback that that helped to streamline that. And the other thing that I would offer is that um, when you get the data back for your assessments, it drives you to specific resources to address. So that also helps narrow the focus. So part of what, um, and then last I'll offer is that the guidance that we've been giving to administrators on what to look for and what to give feedback on has built. So we really prioritized, we gave them a set of guidance for September, and then we get a, gave them a set of guidance in October, and then one to get them through December, and then one beginning um, in January. And that was intentional to narrow, again, narrow that focus. We're going to focus on this component. We're going to focus on these specific resources that have high utility um, as teachers are continuing to get their feet wet. And again, that's where I think when it's your second time teaching a unit, hearing from teachers to say, what did you pick last time that you wouldn't pick this time? What did you identify is more appropriate based on your student data because they have more familiarity. So just to follow up on that, are we taking, is someone collecting all that information so that each <laughs> teacher doesn't have to go through this process every time they, yes. they start? Yes, yes. so it's, it's a both and. It out as like a, here you go, 
There's your no, welcome. Yes, we, it's, a, it's a both and. So actually, and Dr. Kraft and I were just, she just emailed me the other day, a giant spreadsheet that we're using to identify specific resources so that we can do exactly that. So in those unit overviews that the team planned, we can highlight the sort of non-negotiable. These are the best resources that yield um, those results. Um, and then also still allow for teacher choice because they know their students best and they're being responsive to that data. But that's exactly the data that we're gathering now to, to support that piece which means that we're actually using data to make recommendations about which resources are yielding those results. And so we're you're doing all of that. And so since we already developed module overviews for every module, we're now going to be able to intersect it with some high yield resources also. Perfect. Thank you. That's great. My last question, and I, I know we talked about this once before, as far as um, the Amira versus Dibbles or dibbles, I'm going to say it wrong. But um, when you're doing the assessments with Comar, even if you have a mirror there, is there still a teacher sitting with the student while she's go or he or she is going through a mirror to do the assessment, or is it just the is it just the mirror I AI person? Does that make do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> um, yes, we do. Oh, no, no, Michelle, go ahead. You can start. I can add in. Yeah, so we we have talked a lot about there was guidance around having that one on one supervision for a digital screener. And so in the administration, we do have sometimes multiple students and the teacher is monitoring and supervising. Um, there are also instances where a teacher is sitting with a student. Um, and then there are also many instances in which the teacher is listening individually to the students after they've completed the AMIRA screener um, because teachers have the ability to edit it on the spot and make any corrections because they can actually hear the recording. So um, I, I want to be um, transparent that in the initial administration, there may not be a one-on-one -on -one administration because part of the benefit is allowing um, teachers to have that flexibility. But there are plenty of avenues for that one-on-one -on -one supervision in terms of analyzing that result and, and working to support students. Um, Dr. Kraft, would you add anything else to that? No, I think that was a beautiful answer that there are multiple ways and also I think that we're also learning as we go about what works. And so I was at a school yesterday and they've decided to use some sub time. So the teacher was pulling the students out one on one. And so there has been some flexibility and we always say make sure that you're matching with what students need. Um, and so there isn't a one size guidance on how to do it. We want to grab accurate data, but also recognize recognize that it's one point of time that we would not ever make any major decisions without looking at multiple data sources. Um, I, I could say more, but I'll stop there in case you have a follow up question. No, I think I've taken up enough. Of, I, I will let somebody else ask a question. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I know I kind of went off. There, no, we appreciate, I appreciate it. No, everything. Thank you. <laughs> you're, you're muted, Janie. I said thank you, Ms. Tominowski. Ms. Pumphrey, do you have a question or two? No, believe it or not, Ms. Dominowski answered all, I have to answer all my <laughs> questions for me. <laughs> um, one follow-up I had to one of the ones Ms. Dominowski asked is, um, do you, can you pull data on the, on the percentage of teachers who are listening to kids? So part of the, the benefits of this program is later on, I can go back and listen, but do we have any, any way to pull that? Like how many, teachers are going back in? Uh, That's a great I, question. It is. Yeah. A, I love that question. I and I'm going to have to follow up because I don't know the um, answer to that, but I can. Yes. That's something I, that they uh, they can access. I, I don't know. It's okay. a great question because what I would and, and Jen can add it to her list tomorrow because tomorrow is the end of the week, Jen. Um, what I think we can definitely pull is the the number of teachers that have made a change because there's actually a record of that. If the teacher makes it, remember I said that you can listen and if you think it was incorrect, you can change it. That's actually a data point that the system would be capturing, but I don't know if you just went in and listened and didn't many, make any edits, if there's a way to capture that. So that's a great question for us to ask. Of We, um, we will find out and follow up because it was a great yeah. question. Okay, thank you. And then um, I was in two schools yesterday and asked to see either HMH or Bridges, and I was just um, unexpectedly surprised to see how many kids were using the workbook to annotate. So I did see, um, I felt like we went back in time in a good way to where kids were using the workbook with the selection in there and annotating it on on the side. So 
Um, that was really nice to see. So that I just add that. Any We're saving other on post it notes? We're saving money on post it. So. Yeah, we are saving. We're, being, we're being fiscally responsible. Fiscally responsible. <laughs> right. Well, we can take the post it note money and put it to the microphone with the ear. There we go. The to the headset. Right. I'm gonna. I'm gonna do that. That's exactly what I'm gonna do. <laughs> All right. um, other questions from board members? Okay. This was just an update, so I know we don't need any. Um, I, I don't want to go slide by slide because I know you had the narration. Right. So in the interest of time, do you just want to move to the questions? Well, let me pause for a second. Um, the next one is just an update on the field test. So I know we are past our ending time. I didn't know if we could postpone this to next time to add, to allow a, a deeper discussion, but that's up to board members whether they want to stay on and hear the secondary or since we're meeting in a couple weeks, um we could start with the secondary field update so board members can you give me a some feedback on what you would like to do at 10 after six i probably have just as many questions so it might be a good idea <laughs> right. Right. I, I i kind of figured that um <laughs> it might be better to wait so we can take a deeper dive into this okay yeah. all right is I anybody in, as well is anybody opposed to that to doing that Okay, we're also going to postpone or maybe even eliminate the special ed update because that is coming to the full board, I believe, at the end of the month. Um, Dr. Donato, is that the time? Yeah, I have to check the date. It's either the end okay. of the month or the very beginning of March. Okay, so that update on strategic plan, we can either include next time or we'll just wait till the for full board here hears it. Um, okay, so we will um, start our next meeting with the secondary field test updates to allow for a richer discussion and questions. Um, I also like to thank staff again. I know I do it uh, most times, but the PowerPoints ahead really, um, really do help and are very informative and, and just really set the stage for our, <laughs> it might not help you guys because it allows for lots more questions from us, but um, it really does help us um, frame the conversation. So thank you for the work that you put into those voiceover PowerPoints. Um, so to board members, is there any further updates anybody needs to bring up? Um, again, I appreciate staff's time and I appreciate board members time and all of our questions um, to get a better understanding of the presentations. And since there is oh, our next committee as meeting, as we said, will now be on February 26, 2024. And since there is no further business, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night.